in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about falsification and the quine duhem thesis. So recall that, according to Popper, scientific theories are falsifiable. If there isn't some possible observation that could refute your theory, then you're not talking about a scientific theory. More precisely, we might think of strong falsification in the following manner. If you recall from the previous lecture, we talked about a method for disconfirmation, and it went something like this. If H, then O. Not O, therefore not H. Um, in the previous lecture, I talked about how this gives us some reason for thinking that H isn't true, but strong falsification makes a stronger claim. It tells us that H is false. So again, H is some hypothesis or theory, and O is an observation predicted by H, what you might call an observation consequence. So again, if theory H tells us that the world is a certain way and we find that the world is not that way, then that theory must be false, according to strong falsification. This view of falsification has not gone uncontested. In the readings, you'll find that both Duhem and Quine take issue with falsification, um, strong falsification that is. And this is the reason why. They think that predictions always require auxiliary assumptions. So hypotheses rely on auxiliary assumptions in order to make predictions. Now what's an auxiliary assumption? An auxiliary assumption is an assumption or condition that taken together with the core claims of the hypothesis allows a prediction to be made. Such assumptions are necessary for making the prediction. I'll give an example in a second. So if this view is right, then yielding an observation consequence or making a prediction is more complicated. It's not just if H then O. It's more like this. If H and A1 and A2 and A3 and so on, then O. So if predictions require this more complex set of auxiliary assumptions and the core claims of the hypothesis, then when the prediction fails, it doesn't follow that the core claims, H, are false. The problem could lie anywhere within the set. Let me give a more concrete example. So consider Newton's universal law of gravitation, represented by H. So according to Newton's gravitational theory, um, every piece of matter attracts every other piece of matter with a force that varies directly with the product of the masses involved and inversely with the square of their distance apart. So mathematically it's represented by uh, g times m1 times m2 divided by d to the power of 2. So f represents the force between the two objects. g represents the gravitational constant m1 is the mass of the first object, m2 is the mass of the second object, and d is the distance between the two objects. So it should be pretty clear that Newton's law itself doesn't make any testable predictions. Um, you can't just look at this law and determine that there's going to be some prediction out there. You're going to find the world to be a certain way. Rather, to get an, a concrete prediction, an observation consequence, you need auxiliary assumptions and initial conditions. So it might be the case that your first auxiliary assumption is that the mass of the first object is 3 grams. The second auxiliary assumption, A2, is that the mass of the second object is 4 grams. A3 is that the distance between them is 2 meters. A4 is that the gravitational constant is 9.8 meters per second squared. But then there's this additional auxiliary assumption, is that our measurements are accurate. After all, you used certain tools and devices to get the values that I've just stipulated. So you need to make sure that your observational instruments and your um, lab equipment is operating properly. So now a prediction from H is possible. So if H and A1 and A2 3 and a4 and a5, then the detectable force between the two objects will be 2 times 10 to the negative 10 newtons. It's okay if you don't understand what that means. The point is merely this, that the predictions yielded from a hypothesis 
never just come from the hypothesis itself. You always need additional claims, additional assumptions. And all of that taken together gives you a prediction, something that can actually be tested. Newton's law itself can't do that for you. So this leads us to the quine duhem thesis. According to the quine duhem thesis, we never test a hypothesis in isolation from auxiliary assumptions, or we never test it in isolation from other beliefs or commitments, etc. Rather, we always test an entire group of claims. It's a group that we're testing. And when our observational data goes against what our theory predicts, we know that our theory is an error, but we don't know exactly where the error lies. Is the problem with the core hypothesis itself, or is it with one of our other beliefs, one of our other assumptions that goes into yielding the prediction? So here's the stronger claim, is that a theory can always be saved from falsification by rejecting or modifying one of the auxiliary assumptions. Strict falsification is impossible. This means that Popper's view of strong falsification is a bit problematic. His, on his view, if you run into anomalous data, that means your theory has been refuted. But if the quine duhem thesis is right, that's not necessarily true. You can always keep the core hypothesis. You just need to modify your auxiliary assumptions in an appropriate manner. So this leads Doom to say, in sum, the physicist can never subject an isolated hypothesis to experimental test, but only a whole group of hypotheses. When the experiment is in disagreement with his predictions, what he learns is that at least one hypothesis constituting this group is unacceptable and ought to be modified but the experiment does not designate which one should be changed. So this raises an important question. When a hypothesis runs into disagreement with empirical data, what do we do? Do we give up the entire set of claims? Do we give up the core claims? Do we modify some of the auxiliary assumptions? I mean, what's rational to do in that sort of case? Logic alone doesn't seem to provide the answers. In fact, according to Quine, we can hold on to any theory we like in the face of contrary evidence, so long as we make up the appropriate modifications to the theory. So empirical data is never going to require, logically require, that we give up our theory, because we can always modify it in the appropriate ways and retain the core claims of the theory. So in summary, strict falsification goes like this. If H, then O, not O, therefore not H. Check out the schema on the left. In this sort of case, it's deductively guaranteed that H is false. So we have deductive proof for thinking H is false. And if we're trying to get at the truth, then we can just give up H. Because we know, deductively, that it's false. But the quine doom thesis shows us that that's not really realistic. That's not actually how hypothesis evaluation takes place. So look at the schema on the right. Again, whenever we test a hypothesis, we never test it in isolation. We need a whole bunch of claims that together make a prediction. So when the prediction fails, it turns out to be false. All we know is that the problem might be with H itself or with one of the auxiliary assumptions. Quine goes on to say that um, hypothesis evaluation is not a rational process. Rather, it's just subject to pragmatic considerations. If it, it's useful for you to keep H around, then just modify some of your auxiliary assumptions. Give up some of the other beliefs in your web of beliefs. You can go ahead and keep the core claims if it suits your purposes. Just give up something else. Duhem seems to take a more modest position. So even though he thinks that logic alone doesn't require us to give up a theory, that nevertheless, it can become irrational to keep holding on to a theory. So suppose you keep running into anomalous data, and you keep modifying your hypothesis to fit the data. At some point, Duhem thinks, you've, you've, you're just going to create a really complex and non-elegant hypothesis. 
And so there are other rational considerations, non-deductive considerations, that lead us to give up a hypothesis. We're not required to deductively, but nevertheless, it's still rational to give up the hypothesis. You might call this weak falsification. So in conclusion, let's consider an historical example. This is kind of fun. So think about the Copernican model of the solar system. According to Copernicus, the sun is at the center, the Earth orbits around the sun, and all the other planets orbit around the sun as well. So I'm going to call this the sun-centered model, or if you prefer, the heliocentric model. So we know that if this model is accurate, then the Earth's orbit is shorter. It takes less time for the Earth to go from one point around the sun back to that same point because it's closer. Um, and there are actually other really interesting reasons for why this is the case, whereas planets that are further out take a longer time to get around. So look at the, the uh, diagram at the bottom. Um, there's a point during the Earth's orbit where it's close to Mars. But since the Earth is orbiting quicker than Mars, eventually the distance between them grows. And you can imagine that Earth is on the other side of the orbit and Mars is on the opposite side. So they sort of lose each other, but then eventually their orbits come back around and then they're close to one another. So it was believed that if this is happening, if, and this is what the Copernican model tells us, then we should see an apparent shift in the size of Mars. When we're looking up at the sky, looking at Mars, it should appear bigger when we're close to it in our orbit. But then when we are far from it and we kind of you know, lose it in our orbit, it should appear smaller because it's really far away. This is pretty intuitive. I mean, if a ship is really far away on the horizon, it looks really small. When it comes near, it looks a lot bigger. So the same thing is happening with Mars. When we approach Mars in our orbit, it should become bigger. It should look bigger to us in the sky. And when we move away from it in our orbit and start to get ahead, it should start to decrease in size. But here's the problem. We don't observe this. At least, we don't observe it with the naked eye. So early on, this was taken to be disconfirmation for the sun-centered model. And if you're thinking of strong falsification, this was taken to be a refutation of the Copernican model. But we just learned from the quine doom thesis that we never test a hypothesis in isolation. Rather, we're always testing a group of claims. So what's important to note is that a key auxiliary assumption was being overlooked. What was the assumption? It was this that either plain sight or the most advanced optical, optical tools are capable of detecting the expected change in the size of Mars. So let H represent the sun-centered hypothesis. Let O be the prediction that we should see an apparent change in the size of Mars. And let V be this auxiliary assumption that um, I introduced at the bottom. So it was thought that H predicts O, O isn't the case, so H must not be the case. The problem is that V was being overlooked. So it's not just H that we're testing, rather we're testing H and a whole bunch of other claims. One of those additional claims was V. The claim that our best optical tools and plain sight would be able to de detect the change in Mars' size. So the real argument should be this, if H and V, then O, not O, therefore either not H or not V. So the defender of the Copernican model can hold on to the core assumptions, the core claims of the hypothesis, and just deny one of the auxiliary assumptions. In this case, he can just deny V. And in fact, that's actually what turned out to be the case. Once better instruments were um, created, uh, better telescopes, we were able to detect a difference in the size of Mars depending on the Earth's location in its orbit. So what's the takeaway? It's this. According to the quine doom thesis, strong or strict falsification can always be rationally avoided.